there are two uh, papers going around. We just like to take attendance to see, of curiosity, who comes back and who's new because of the particular topic. Um, I'm Annette Davis in charge of the Voices of the Past program and also had some responsibilities for our tour last summer when we decided we were going to see where the settlers originally went uh, a little bit west of Grand Island and where Anna Steer Thompson had lived. And it opened a lot of questions and at the annual meeting, Judy Hillison was there and said she would give a presentation about the history of Anna Steer Thompson as she knew it, and evidently the word has spread because uh, we have people from, raise your hand if you're a Thompson descendant. From quite a ways away, I think. So we'll get started so you have time to visit afterwards. Judy Hillison. Can you hear me? Do I, have to, do I have to do this? Okay, well, if I roam around and I talk off the top of my head, so if I'm away from this and you can't hear me, raise your hand, I'll talk louder. That's the solution to everything, talk louder. I want to thank um, the Hall County Historical Society for inviting me to speak today about the life of Anna Steer Thompson. Uh, there are some special people here that I want to give a special thank you to. I'm going to introduce them first. They don't need to stand. I'll let you know who they are. First, there's a very special thank you that goes out today to Leah Thompson Jensen. Leah is a third generation granddaughter of John and Anna Thompson. Um, Leah, is it okay if I share how old you are? Okay, <laughs> Leah is 87 years old. She's with us today. She's accompanied by her nephew, David, and his wife, Marge. They've come to us from Lincoln. Dwayne Thompson is here. Dwayne is a descendant coming from the family, and he is visiting uh, today with us from Kansas City. Daryl. Daryl, excuse me, Daryl. Where did I get Dwayne? There's Daryl. And uh, my mom and my aunt are here, Eunice and Arlene. My daughter is in the back with my grandsons, uh, Sharon Durer, and my grandsons, Dylan and Anthony, who represent seventh generation. You'll be hearing more about some of these people during the talk as we go along today. So I want to let you know first um, the line that I come from. There, are, there were five children of Anna and John Thompson. They had one girl named Emma. Emma married John Schultz. They raised eight children to adulthood, one of them being my grandfather, August. He was the youngest boy in that family. He had two girls. They were Arlene and Eunice, and I am Judy. I am the oldest of their children. So I am fifth generation of founding family of Hall County. Before we get started on what I know to be facts and what I assume and what I don't know, because I'll tell you all of that as we go through. I want to tell you about how I came to be here today. Back in 2004, I took a cemetery tour. And a cemetery tour is a wonderful thing to go on. If you get the opportunity, I highly recommend it to people. Through the cemetery tour, you're taken into the old section of the old cemetery and there were a lot of gravestones that they were talking about the founding families. So I'm going through this tour and I raised my hand with a question and I said, well, what about Anna Steer? And they said, well, we know she was a member of the founding family. We know she's buried in the city cemetery, but we don't know much else about her. And I thought, I know stuff. I would like to get grandma's story to at least some people so that when you're on the cemetery tour, maybe you could get a little bit more information. So I went home and I put on my list of my goals and resolutions for 2005 was to try to bring a little bit of Anna Steer's history out to the community through the Historical Society and to get Grandma's grave marked as founding family because I knew where the grave was. They, at that time, they didn't know where the grave was. 
So along comes 2005, and I'm going about my business, and I come to the annual meeting of the Hall County Historical Society. And I come into their meeting, they have a dinner, it's a very nice evening if you get to come, it's very, very, a, a very nice evening to come to, very good food, very good com camaraderie amongst people. And I was here about the whole sum of 15 minutes before someone found out who I was. And they approached me and said, would you like to give a talk to our voices of the past about the history of Anastir? And I go, sure. <laughs> and then 15 minutes later, I went, what did you do? Why are you not running for the door and running for the hills as fast as you can go? Because I thought about it and I thought, all of the things that I know about Grandma, I could probably stand here and talk to you for about four minutes. Everything that I know factually about Grandma, at that point, like I said, would take four minutes. But what I knew in my heart about Grandma, I could stand here for a whole, a whole day and talk to you about that. But I thought, in the meantime, what would I impart to you? And then comes through my brain my mom's voice. And this voice has come into my brain many a times in the past with one sentence. And she said it many a time, and that came through my, through my brain again that night. It was, you come from a line of strong women. You can do anything. So I thought, okay, I come from a line of strong women, and I can do this. So I thought, okay, I'll do it. Besides, I can talk to my mom, and I can talk to my aunt, and they'll tell me all kinds of stories. So I said, well, what do we have that belongs to Grandma Steer? And they went, nothing. And I said, well, what do we know about that? Well, we know what Grandpa told you. And so then I'm going, okay, now, research time. Through the course of this, I have been blessed by many of these family people that are sitting over there who have just called and volunteered information. We've gotten together, we've talked, we've had laughs about everything. I've learned a lot through this. So through the course of today, you're going to hear about the things that we know to be true about Grandma Steer and her trip here. I'm going to tell you about a few of the assumptions that I've made about her trip and some of the things that I assume to be about her life. And then there will be a lot of things that I just simply don't know about. And I'll tell you, I don't know about them. So I'm going to go ahead and get started today with my little story that says, Once upon a time, in Littenberg, the town, in the province of Holstein, in the community of the ununified states of Germany, there was born a girl on April 27th of 1833. Her name was Anna. What her middle name is, I do not know. What her parents' names were, I do not know, and here comes a train. So, <laughs> all I do know is, is that she had one older brother. His name was William, and he was born on September 20th of 1831. Sometime during her childhood, Anna's parents died, and she was raised by an uncle. When she was 18 years old, her brother left to go to America. He would write to Anna, I assume, because she knew where he was, and tell her what he was doing in America. He was on a, um, he was a fireman on a river steamer that would go up and down the Mississippi and put out barge fires. While he was in the United States, he had married. Anna remained in Germany, and she was engaged to a young man named John Thompson. My grandpa, who August Schultz, used to tell me that grandpa was a butcher and that he lived in the approximately the same area as where Anna Steer lived. During the times of the 1850s, Germany had a lot of problems. The country was trying to fight amongst its own little provinces um, because they weren't unified. Over there at that time, you had a country, you had Austria, you had Prussia, you had Germany trying to establish its borders but it wasn't a unified com country at that time. So there were a lot of wars going on and a lot of uneasiness and provinces were taken over and provinces were given back. So this was all going on in Grandma's time over there. 
What prompted her to decide to come to America, I don't know. But one day, in the spring of 1857, Anna Steer got on a boat in Kiel, Germany, and she set sail to America. There were other people from her community on that same boat, but Anna again by herself, leaving John Thompson in Germany and coming here. They sailed up the Mississippi River and she landed in Davenport, Iowa, and that's where she was met by her brother and his wife. Now first I'd like to share with you a little bit about what's going on in America when Grandma arrives. She came to the country, she came from conflict to a country that also was in conflict. At the time there were 31 states in the Union. Several of these states were free states and several of these states were slave states. And during the presidency of Andrew Jackson, he had made a decree that all of the, and I'm going to use the word Indian for the purpose of this speech, but he had declared that all Indians needed to live on the west side of the Mississippi River. So they were all displaced to the west side of the Mississippi. As civilizations expanded west, the Indians were pushed further west and they ended up being displaced to the west side of the Missouri River. Now the Kansas-Nebraska Territory was surrounded by states. There were states to the south, states to the east, and states to the west. What amazed me was California and Oregon were already states of the Union and we were the Wild West out here in the middle. This was a developed, undeveloped territory and it was open wilderness. It had been surveyed back in 1817 and it had been deemed to have some fertile land but most of it was wasteland. So it wasn't really that good for farming. It was also the place where all of the Indians had been squished into. There was a lot of wildlife out here. We all know there was a lot of buffalo. There were also elk. There were also antelope. There were also many Indian tribes. There was a lot of grassland and some a small wildlife. The primary Indian tribe that lived around here we know is the Pawnee. There were also frequent visits by the Sioux and there were six other uh, tribes that also came through the area kind of sort of on a regular basis. And to me I often wondered if grandma knew what she was getting into when she headed out because coming from a community in Germany, um, going out into the wilderness, not knowing anything, being in a strange country, and I'm going to assume, not speaking English, that I wondered what's going through her mind. And I guess I can only guess what was going through her mind at that time, but being a brave woman, she's going out there and tackle it. The reason that they formed the organization, and I know a lot of you know a lot about the history of Hull County because of the Davenport Company that was founded to bring settlers to the, this community, was because there was the idea that after or because of the conflicts with the slave states and the free states that they were going to have to relocate Washington DC and what better place to relocate it but in the center of the country and why not have some established communities out here in the center of the country where they could um, be ready to accept this honor of being the capital of the United States. So there were several people in this Davenport company who said we'll just put up flyers all over, we'll see who responds to our flyers and we'll pay. If they don't have any money, we'll pay to uh, give them provisions and we'll send them out there into the wilderness and we'll give them 320 acres of land as long as they agree that of the 320, as soon as they get title to it, they give 160 back to the, com the company so that they can use it to form the town, which eventually would be the capital of the United States. So it was all great idea at the time. They would get these people, they'd have the friars up, they would get all these people together, they'd truck them all off, or not truck them all off, but have them journey off into the wilderness, and um, they would provide provisions for them and people could repay for the provisions at the time when they were able to within a year. The grandma's brother had a job in Davenport. Why he would want to leave that job, I don't know. Why Grandma could have got a job there, why she didn't stay there, I don't know. 
I'm, what I think is that here is this enticement that you can own land. You can go out and you can establish and you can develop and you can be a landowner. And that's my assumption, is the reason that they started out. So they agree that they are going to be part of the group that heads off to uh, this territory. When they left Davenport, Iowa on March 28th of 1857, there were five wagons, there were 16 yoke of oxen, and some dogs. There were 25 men, five of them were married, they had wives. There was one child, and there was grandma, who is affectionately known in all of the history stuff as the one single white woman. And they were the people who trucked across Iowa in their little covered wagon train. They made 23 miles a day. They got up at 4 o'clock in the morning so they could be on the road at 6 o'clock in the morning. They would try and make 23 miles in a day. When they would stop, the women would cook. The men would have to scout for water along the way so that there would be water for when they did stop so that they would have water. They would also probably try and bring a few little wildlife in for food so that those could be cooked and prepared for that time. But it took them 23 days for this wagon train to get across Iowa. Now the wagons were heavily loaded down with all of their provisions, so most of the people had to walk. So Grandma walked 23 days across the state of Iowa. Now you can drive across the state of Iowa in a, couple, in a few hours, and it's a long drive to get across the state of Iowa. And when I do it, I think back to the time when they had to walk across the state of Iowa. But in 23 days, they got to Omaha, and they spent one day in Omaha resting because their supplies then had come up the Missouri, the supplies for the community were to meet them in Omaha, and then they would head off to this area. So there are five wagons, there are extra supplies for establishing the community, um, the oxen that they had, all of those set off from Omaha coming west. They passed Fremont, which was a really big booming town of 10 houses. Then they got to Columbus, which had 18 houses. And that was about it for when they ran into settled settlements. So they were coming along down the river and they got to this community of Hall County and they stopped here on July 2nd of 57 and they surveyed this area, looked around, people went out in different directions thinking, is this a good place or is this not? Should we go further? Where should we do? Um, one of the things that my mom always told me that my grandpa said was is that they had actually considered going a little further west, but they'd met some Mormons coming back along the trail who said, don't go that way, it's a desert out there. So they ended up staying right where they were. And that is now the settlement of Hall County. At the time, Grandma was 24 years old. I know she spoke German. How much English she spoke, I don't know. But you would think somewhere along the way she probably had to learn how to pick up some English. Her role was to be the cook, to take care of the laundry, to set up the meals, to clean up the meals. The parties had decided that they were going to build four houses that first summer when they got here. Each of these houses would have two rooms in them, approximately 14 by 14. So they would have eight rooms. Five married couples um, could occupy five of the rooms. I'm going to assume Anna stayed in a room with her brother. And the single men all had to share the other three. But they all chose their roles in what they had to do. They had to um, some of the men had to prepare making the, the buildings. Some of the men had to break up the land. Some of the men had to go back to Omaha to get more rations or more supplies because they constantly, you can't just run down to the quick shop and pick anything up. So they had to go back to Omaha and get things. So when they knew how long is it going to take for this first trip to go back and forth, they decided that they would um, ration out things. So. Where I've got a thing I want to show you right now. Okay. 
The original settlement where they first stopped is located around where the family farm is right now, where Ray Evans lives. And I, all of you had said, or and Ed had mentioned before about the trip, about going out to the house. Ray lives on the current property from Anastere, and Ray has been very gracious in allowing us to come out there, walk around. I think Ray's a, he's an adoptive member of our family because he loves our history as much as we do. Actually, um, there are things that would, he'll say something and I'll go, I didn't know that. So, but anyway, um, when you are out on the family area, it's a really long drive into, to get into the, where the housing site is. The settlements and everything where they originally stopped were closer to the roads, closer to the uh, way up front part of it. Everybody had to um, play their role, and I can only assume that when Grandma was out here in the wild or in the wilderness, with limited rations, her fiance was back in Germany. Grandma came with what she had on her back, very few clothes, and here she was out here in a community trying to establish an area of which to live. Now, when you go out to the found the place now, you will see um, light wires and that. But you do see going up Ray's long driveway. You see an open um, pasture area out there, and to me, if you Think about it in your mind's eye. That's what the whole place looked like. Undeveloped, mines, nothing out there. Um, and the Pawnee Indians, according to my grandpa, living in the thicket not too long away. During the time that the settlers were out here, um, the military was over at Fort Kearney. And the military would come through because they ha were in charge of keeping Indian uprisings to a minimum because the Indians didn't get along with each other very well. And as the settlers came in and were intrusive on the uh, Pawnee lands, uh, even though the Pawnee were a friendly people, they were still a little agitated that people were taking away their lands. So Grandma again is out here uh, with uncertainty as to what's going to become of this community. The militia had to be out here to tone down these clashes that were going on. And sometime during the fall of 1857 or the spring of 1859, Grandma had to go to Fort Kearney. As Leah says, it's out of necessity. The military told Grandma, it's not safe for you out here. You're a single white woman. You don't have a man to take care of you. And it was commonly known that the Indians would um, kidnap and would take children. So they didn't feel that it was safe for Anna to be out here by herself. Now, I'm going to make an assumption that Grandma went there in, eight, nine, in 1858. And I'll explain the reason why I'm making this assumption. Um, you're going to hear some stories about Grandma being over in Fort Kearney because she was a nanny to the captain. and when. There'll be a few more people up here explaining some of the things that we have on display. I'll be sharing this stage with them. They're going to give you a few more little stories about that in a moment. So in 1858, it was the first year that there could be crops, because the farmers had come in the middle, or the pioneers had come in the middle of 1857. So this 1858 was the first year you could have crops out here. They had broken approximately 50 acres of land. They could put in crops. They were working on their housings. And they had, being the diligent people that they were, they had made contract with the military to provide grain to Fort Kearney. Now, at the time, Fort Kearney was getting their grains from Missouri, the state of Missouri. And they were paying approximately 3 and a half to $4 a bushel to get their grain brought in. So the settlers said to them, well, we can do it. We'll charge $2 a bushel and get the grain to you. So that was a very, very favorable deal for both parties. And all they had to do with then was to deliver on that contract that they had made. It was in the spring of 1858 when William Steer and his wife had a baby. Her name was Nellie and she was born on March 3rd of 1858. So if I deduce right, that makes grandma and aunt. 
Also in the January of 1858, there was a prairie fire and the fire had destroyed the homes of William Steer and Henry Shale. So they had lost their housing. Uh, at that time, William Thompson's wife would have been approximately seven months pregnant. And with the help of the community, they had rebuilt and survived through this. This is when I made the assumption that Grandma would have gone to Fort Kearney. She was an aunt. The household that she was living in uh, was expanding. Again, strife between the um, Indians that was going on was, um, would reach higher levels of aggravation than at other times. So that my assumption was is that's when Grandma went to Fort Kearney. Um, at the time that she would have gone to Fort Kearney, there were still several of the original people here, of the original family, and in July 5th of 1858, another party had come from Davenport. They brought 20 people with them. They brought 10 teams of horses, 20 yokes of oxen, and they brought cows this time, and a few chickens. So this is the first time that there was this kind of livestock into the settlement. It was the first year of their growing season. The settlers had had a long winter. They had rationed their supplies because they had had to figure out how to live between the times that people could get those wagons back and forth to Omaha. The financial crisis of that time frame had also bankrupt the Davenport Company, so the Davenport Company didn't have any money to send them supplies with anymore. So here sits our little band of survivors out here in the Midwest. They're, the company had invested approximately $6,000 in them to bring them out here. Uh, they didn't ask the settlers to give the money back, which was a good thing, but it left them out here all by themselves to try and figure out how were they going to set up this community and how were they going to deal with um, building things because they were, no money was going to come to them so they were going to have to figure out where they were going to get that income from and they were going to have to figure out how they were going to work out arrangements with the Pawnee Indians. So in 1859 the settlers also had a good year but this was the time that gold was uh, discovered out in Pikes Peak in Colorado and there were a lot of people coming along the trail. Now, Grandma's house, and I should have a marker up here, but I don't. Grandma's house is on the Oregon Trail. When you go through, or the property is anyway, when you're coming down the Oregon Trail, it can come in several different ways. So now I'm gonna step away from here, so hopefully you can hear me. But the Oregon Trail is coming through, and it's coming south of these, thank you. It's coming through here, and when this would get high with water, sometimes people would have to route around and go this way. But this was right on the trail where there was a lot of traffic going, coming and going. At this time, Grandma wasn't living here. This was just part of the original settlement area. But Grandma liked this area, and you're going to hear why in a little bit. Um, in 18, in um, September, or no, January of 1859, there was a large fire because a lot of the prospectors didn't like the German people. And so the fire destroyed eight of the houses that had already been established in the community. So again, here was the community trying to rebuild again, which they did. One of the things that I found through my reading was, and my daughter said, Mom, you better check this out. You think these prices are right? But they were. I checked them out in a couple of different areas. They could sell a watermelon for a dollar to the travelers on the trail. They could sell a head of cabbage for 50 cents to the travelers on the trail. Also on the trail, as it came through, when people passed away, they were buried along the trail. On the property where Ray now lives, there are four unmarked graves. Two of them we know to be people who are from the Mormon Trail travelings and the other two I don't know anything about. But Grandma at this time was over in Fort Kearney and there were establishing a, straight, uh, a stagecoach line that was coming through because we were getting developments out here and the stagecoach line was coming through and mail was coming through one time a week. 
So it was easier then for Grandma to get a letter back to Germany and tell John Thompson where she was. So they made arrangements that he would come, and he left in 1859, and he headed off to uh, America. They were going to meet in the Council Bluffs, Omaha area. Now, Grandpa Schultz used to tell me that Grandpa was a, da a draft dodger. And that, I guess, is because there were still all the conflict going on in Germany. They were still trying to become a unified state, and they were at war with about everybody. So Grandpa left. He, again, by himself, got on a boat and came over. In 1859, when Grandpa got on his boat to come over here, uh, Abraham Lincoln was the President of the United States. And war, the Civil War, was inevitable. And so the military over in Kearney had to prepare to leave, because they were going to be used to fight the war. And they were going to have to go and fight in, in Missouri, because Missouri was a slave state, and they were going to have to fight on the Union side in Missouri. So they knew there would be conflict coming. They knew the military wouldn't be around here in the, um, mid, in the middle areas where the community was. And they had said to the people, it's time for you guys to be thinking about leaving. But the settlers didn't go anywhere. They stayed. The military left, not all of them, but uh, the great majority of them left to go off to Missouri. And this is the time when Grandma and the captain's wife took the stage to Omaha and met up with John Thompson. Now, I don't know the day that they got married. I know they got married in the Council Bluffs, Omaha area, um, somewhere close to the very beginning of 1860. What I do know is, is that, um, what I wrote down to tell you, was uh, that they traveled to back to this settlement and they established residency in Alda Township. What I read was Grandma enticed Grandpa to come to this area because she said to him, it's so pretty and you'll just love it there because I love it there. And so John Thompson was enticed by Anna Steer to come to this area. Now, I think in my, my mind, I keep thinking, okay, Grandpa is a butcher back in Germany. Grandpa, what does he know about farming? What does he know about living in the wilderness? And yet his new bride is saying, come on, let's go live in the wilderness. They buy a stove. They buy a couple of chairs, a table, a bed. That's their personal belongings. For their farm equipment, they bought a single section harrow, a plow, a spade, a pitchfork, and some garden tools. They owned a yoke of oxen, and they had a couple of chickens, and they headed off. Now, in my mind, I'm sitting here going, how did they pay for this stuff? Grandpa probably had a little bit of money when he came here from Germany, I assume, and I also assume that Grandma may have had some from when she was working as a nanny in Kearney. I don't know that for sure. Also, I don't know for sure, maybe what they had was a lot. When I looked at this list, I thought, this is not very much to go somewhere and live. But maybe at that time it was. I don't know. Also, I also wondered, what, how did Grandpa know what to buy? Obviously, he had to trust somebody who would give him ideas on what he needed to purchase. So they have their purchases. They come out here into our community. And this is the area that Grandma fell in love with. The area where Ray now lives, the Thompson farm, which is still in the Thompson family. And when they first came out here to this community, they lived in a, a dugout, which was partially in the ground with some sod up the side and saplings over the top. And that's where they established their home. Uh, Grandma instantly became pregnant. And so they went about then figuring, we need to get a place to live. So they went about setting up how to build a sod house and a sod barn and a sod chicken house so that they could keep track of all of the things that they had. So here they are out in the community, just getting here at the beginning of 1860. And this is where Anna Steer becomes Mrs. John Thompson. 
And any time that you will see things in the newspapers, you will see it will say John and Mrs. John Thompson because grandma became the wife and the mother. She wasn't Anna Steer Thompson as we refer to her today. She was Mrs. Thompson, Mrs. John Thompson. Even though she was a strong woman, she um, knew where her place, or not actually knowing where her place was, but assumed the role that she always knew where the woman was to be. They lived approximately a, a mile north of where the Pawnees lived. And so here they're out there in the community living in a dugout a mile away from the Pawnee with the child on the way. And the military takes off because the war breaks out. Now, they had several children. They had five children, and I'm going to show you the ancestry. Anna and John Thompson got married in 1860. They had five children. Henry, who was their oldest son, and he lived to be age 48. Their second child was William. William had two children named William and Leah, who is here with us today. Their third child was Fred. Fred had one daughter named Anita, and her family is here today, and they'll be talking here shortly. Then there was my grandma, Emma Thompson, or Emma Thompson Schultz. She married John Schultz. They raised eight children to adulthood, and those are the listings. My grandpa is the last one on the list there. The last child was John Jr., and he had Eli, Emil, and Arthur. So those were the children. There were 10 children who were born in the course of, um, five children, excuse me, who were born in the course of 10 years. During the time frame that they're out here in this community building and developing this area, um, in addition to their just grow, raising their children and establishing this community. The telegraph came through in the early parts of the 1860s. The railroad came through this area in 1866, and Nebraska became a state in 1867. So there was a lot of things going on in the community, and it was developing rapidly. More and more people kept coming. The first massacre that happened here, uh, Grandpa got to be involved in that in a partial way. On February 5th of 1862, there was the massacre of the, the Smith family. And when they had found these people had been killed by the Indians, and we, they can't say that it was the Pawnee or the Sioux, they don't know. But when they had come upon this, Grandpa got the word out, and eight men tried to track the Indians who had done this, but after two days it snowed and they lost the trail. There are a couple of stories that I know about that uh, Grandpa used to talk about, because Grandpa was a believer, not because he um, was prideful or boastful about Anna Steer, but because of the respect that he had for the hard life that they uh, went through to get here. Um, he talked about how, Grandma talked about how the Indians would come up to their windows and uh, put their hands over the windows and look in at any hour of the day. He talked about how sometimes the Indians just walked into the house and that there were times when they would just take the dumplings that Grandma was making in the pan right out of the pan. Even though the fire was hot, they would just reach in and take them out. Sometimes they would come and Grandma would go out and feed chickens and they, were, they would be in the house and they would just sit down and eat with the family and then they'd get up and go. They liked bread and molasses. Now, to me, I always wondered, where did the molasses come from until I realized, okay, that comes from sugar beets, and we grew sugar beets out here. But they had a really tough time. The Indians would uh, come, the squaws would come with their children um, because they were barefooted, and they would come and get milk. Grandma was very gracious in giving away all of the extra things that she had. She would give away her extra milk, her extra molasses, her extra bread, if she had it. She was willing to share. One of the stories that Leah told me that made Leah really, really sad was Grandma relied a lot on her milk cow. She had all these children that she needed to feed, and one day Grandma went to the barn and her milk cow was dead. And that has to be crushing for people when you rely on a staple like that. So Leah said Grandma had to rely on the neighbors until they could find a way to replace that cow. 
So all of these were things that were going on. The, their life was hard. They were, were working. I'm assuming that through the course of the time that when they were having these children, um, that they had moved into a sod house, their children kept coming, they built a two-story log cabin. The two-story log cabin sits on the property where Ray lives. It, it's not there anymore, but that's where it was. When you drive up his long driveway, you go through that little enclosed area right there to the left, that's where the log cabin sat. So when I went out there that one day on Sunday and walked around, I felt like I was connected. I looked out over the land to the south, which would be looking to the Indian thicket, and I saw a pivot there now, but at that time it wouldn't have been there. It would have just been open territory. And I had things run through my mind like, what did Grandma think when she saw all those cranes come through? And what did they think about when they saw that first funnel cloud and tornado? Because those would be things that you wouldn't think about when you would go to another country, uh, learning how to speak the language, learning how to integrate yourself into the community, diverse cultures all over the place, and then the natural things that come along your way. What I'm going to do now is turn over to Mary Stoltenberg. Um, she's going to give you some information about uh, some of the items of furniture that we have here and some stories that she knows about what it's like for when Grandma had to raise boys. I only come from the girl. Girls don't have exciting stories. Girls are the homemakers. So the boys, they could be ornery. And, uh, so she'll share with you a little bit about the furniture that's here, and hopefully she shares a couple of little stories, and hopefully she shares the story that she knows about Grandma when she was the nanny over in Kearney. So Mary, would you come up here? So first we finished one in 1949. The rest were finished as we needed them. <coughs> They've been conversation pieces from time to time. One has a marble top, and the origin of that is unknown. One both her purchase with the first money she made as a dressmaker when she came to this country. And the other one was Fred Bertha's wedding furniture. One has a built-in hat box with a little drawer above it for my lady's hats and her gloves. One has two little brackets, I guess you would call them, that had oil lamps that the lady could see to adjust her hat. Cindy has that set now, but the other two are still in my house and they'll have homes someplace in the family someday. They've been conversation pieces about what these various things are. And a time or two, someone has said, what's that little door in the washstand? And I said, well, that's where the potty was. <laughs> you either got total silence or a not <laughs> Many of you people thought, remember the flood of 1947. I was in the seat of the scouts when we turned the radio on for the new news, and it was all about the terrible flood in Grand Island, Nebraska. The Wood River came up just to a matter of feet from Grandpa Fred's house, and of course it flooded the basement. He had been 
deceased since May of 46. But he had a storeroom filled with various things, including wooden boxes filled with wool quills, pictures, and books. All of that was lost. But four wooden rockers survived, two slot backs and two spindles. Now the slot backs we, we, uh, we finished later on so the girls would have something to wrap their babies in. But this refinishing became our hobby back in the 50s. And Bruce knew the slot backs were both red and dirty. But the spindles, no one knew. So we started with the one we have down here. And with the moisture, everything was loose. So we had to take it entirely apart and we glue everything. And he came in from Jim Campbell and I was the one that took them apart. He put it back there. And he said, are you sure you know what you're doing? Because each one of those sticks have to go back in the right hole. And I said, well, that little bundle there is the back, and that one is the left arm, and that one's the right arm. Well, as you can see, we did get it back together. And I, it had water stains on it, which I couldn't get out. Somebody even told me to use clocks, and that didn't work. So I painted it black. Well, then when it went to live with Sydney, she chose to have it professionally restored and have it stay dark so it doesn't show the model anymore. And uh, then, I'm sorry we should have brought the other rocker, but I thought maybe that'd be a little much. But the other one is this one. And it was in worse shape than that one. And I'll lay these out, you can look at them later. And when I got it down to the point where I wanted to put the seat in it, there, there was nothing to tie to for the springs, and there was no webbing left, no nothing. So I took it to Hein Upholstery. Mr. Hein did a real good job putting it back together. And uh, when I went to pick it up, I told him about this one. I told him about this one, and I told him there was a dilemma as to whether these rockers belong to my husband's grandparents, which would be Fred and Bertha, or whether they belong to the great grandparents, Anna and John. So he said, well, I can tell you, when the hardwood on this chair, that it is a cradle rocker, and it dates back to the Civil War. And the other one was a spring rocker, is what it was called. So then we knew the two rockers belonged to John and that. So they've been in our house for, oh, I don't know how many years, and then that one now lives with Cindy, and the black one was kind of a traveling man because after it left our house, it uh, went to Vicky's, our daughter, and now it belongs, in, or it lives in Rachel's house, my grandmother. And she's the one that took the pictures for me. And uh, I tease her a little bit because and you go there, it's well on the morning, it's tucked in her bedroom, and there's two or three cough pillows in it. And I said, you might just as well put a sign, and that said, nobody sits in this chair. <laughs> <laughs> but then, now we go to the spinning wheel. Uh, well, that was in Fred's house, too. And apparently, it must have been on top of those wooden boxes because it has no water stain at all. It's just exactly the way it was. After we were married for a little while, uh, Grandma Nita said the girls weren't interested in history, so she gave it to Bruce. And it was in our house many, <coughs> many years, way up, you know, 50 years more. And uh, 
we talked about what we were going to do with it because we had three kids and we were going to draw straws. We considered Story Museum and then we scrapped that idea. And then about, oh, I'd say 10 days or two weeks before Bruce passed away, we were in Clarkson Hospital in Omaha. And uh, he said, uh, how in the world will I ever repay Cindy for all her time? And the trips to Omaha, and there were many between 1990 and 2001. And I said, well, it's your decision, but how about the screen wheel? So it lives with Cindy. Okay, I thank for your time, and I think Cindy's going to do the talking. Oh, Cindy's going to do. The, I'm going to stand up here next to the person who talks because I've got the mic on that's going to the camera. That's why I'm here, guys. Oh, okay. <laughs> I say, uh, we have lots of stuff that's floating around the house, and it, it's floating to the next generation. I just, uh, I just think that's the way where it should be. I've known so many families that have fights over. Uh, a sale after someone is deceased, and I, I just don't wish for that to happen. So I prefer to for these things to have a home before there is a fight. And uh, I got about the pot that you see there was Fred and Bertha's. Did you say the 25th anniversary then? Uh, John and Anna gave it to Fred and Bertha. Okay. If you didn't hear it, she said, Anna gave that to John and Bertha for their 25th wedding anniversary. But see, uh, they have been away from me for so long, I don't even know who wants to come on. <laughs> okay, I think that's probably all I've got. Okay, Cindy, would you come up here, please? While she's coming up, do you know anything about where they got the spinning wheel and who used it? It was not. It was Anna Thompson. But we don't know what it came from. Where she got it and when. Yeah. Well, she didn't get it in Omaha because it wasn't part of the original stuff they came with. So somewhere along the line in 1860, when they got back here, somehow or rather, she acquired this. Cindy, I'm going to stand next to you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm a fifth generation. Uh, my dad was Bruce Stoltenberg. Uh, well, Fred, which is Anna and John's uh, third, third son, third child, was my great grandfather. And I'm just going to tell a couple quick stories that I've heard through the years. Um, one of them was she talked about Anna being at the Fort Kearney as a governess. And my dad always told the story that Grandpa Fred said that uh, she took care of the officer's children. And um, supposedly, I don't know whether this is true or not, the officer was Jewish. And she was taking care of the babies, and the babies were cutting teeth, and they were crying and fussing. And one night they had pork ribs for supper. So Anna swiped a pork rib and trimmed it all off, and she gave the baby the pork rib to chew on to cut its teeth, <laughs> which we kind of think now, the Jewish probably would, if, the, if it is true, we always thought that was quite humorous. Uh, one of the other stories they told is of um, my grandpa Fred, and it'd be Leah's dad, Bill, William. Um, Anna sent him out to herd the cattle, and graze the cow, and they were on their ponies, and they played with the Pawnee kids a lot. And they got down to the river, and the Pawnee Indian kids, they hollered at them, they wanted to go swimming. Well, the boys thought, well, that's a lot more fun to go swimming than herding cows. So they bailed off their ponies and um, pulled off their overalls and went swimming with the Indians in the river. And pretty soon they look around, and the cows are just scattered everywhere. And they're thinking, oh, boy, we're in trouble now. So they jumped on their ponies bare naked and took them a little while to get the cattle rounded up. Well, um, 
When they finally got the cows rounded up, Bill watched the herd while Fred put his overalls on and vice versa. Well, you know how it is when you're out in the sun for a while, it takes till evening when things start really warming up. <laughs> and uh, they got home for supper that night and they couldn't sit down to eat their supper. And Grandma Anna couldn't figure out why they couldn't sit down to eat their supper. Well, they couldn't tell her that they'd been swimming in the river not watching the cows or they were gonna be in trouble. So that was always quite humorous about that one. And then one other one was a grandma always told, and like she said, when they came out here, it was wide open prairie. There was no trees to speak of. There was some thickets, but there was no trees to speak of. So grandma would put provisions in a wagon and Fred and Bill were for several days and they'd drive that wagon when she talks about the hard times and the horses up to the loop and they'd dig trees until they filled the wagon and ran out of provisions. And then they'd drive back and plant all those trees and that's how there got to be timber around here. And where she talks about the Thompson farm and where my grandpa Fred grew up, they, they butt against each other and there's a big shelter belt. And we always, I always assume that's probably where the trees came from, that they, they brought those. But if you think about how easy we have it today when drive a horse and wagon for how many days up and dig trees by hand and put them in. We, we don't know how lucky we are, so. There's a little extra to that story, too. Um, they used to take a little bit of whiskey along, mm -hmm. so it was a nice trip up, nice trip <laughs> digging trees, nice trip back, however long the whiskey lasted. I've got a feeling Grandma didn't probably pack that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there's a few last things that we'd, I'd like to go over with you before we wrap up today. Um, there were lots of ups and downs through all of those years that they lived out here. Um, and that's the same way with, with farming these days. It's all a lot of ups and downs. There were years, like in 63, when they had a frost on August 29th, which took care of the majority of the crops. There were times when there were early blizzards and they couldn't get the corn in. There were times when they lost livestock to early blizzards. They also lost people to early blizzards. As Grandma Ch um, Thompson's children grew to adulthood, they all went to school. And my Grandpa Schultz used to say that William was one of the most intelligent people he'd ever met. He could just read a book and he knew everything, just like that. Um, before we close, we've already had everybody to uh, raise their hands that are part of the Thompson family. Um, I'd like to have you all stand um, for those of you that are part of Anna Steer's family. I was hoping that there'd be a way that we could try and get a picture together today, but I don't know if we can do that. So would the Thompson family please stand? If, they, if that those are able to do that. Get up. Just in closing today, I wanted to let you know that I believe that Anna Steer was a very strong and independent woman. When she reached the end of her life, I think she could say that she'd lived a good life, that she could pass away happy. Her, she had a, a strong family unit. They lived close to each other. They enjoyed good times together. She had grandchildren that she enjoyed immensely. She was a very blessed woman. Um, she was a very respected woman. Uh, she was also the wife of a very respected man. John Thompson was very respected in the community. His word was his bond. Um, he established many of homestead um, lands because when you, you could get 160 acres uh, for the Homestead Act and as long as you improved it, you could continue to do that and Grandpa did. He was a very frugal person. Um, when Grandma, after Grandpa passed away, Grandma continued to live in the house that she lives in. And that house is um, where the Thompson, I'm going to be away from the mic now. Here's where Ray lives. This is Grandma's house. It's just a hop, skip, and a jump to the east. This is the house that Grandma lived in until uh, she was moved into Alda. They, she lived in Alda. And 
This community right here is where my grandpa Schultz was born. So you can see the family all lived close together. Here, here was Fred Thompson, this is William Thompson, this was Emma Thompson Schultz. So they all were in close proximity together. And they would all get together and when I would, I laughed with Leah one day, we talked about that. I said, what's it like when the family would get together? Because when we got together, we played cards. She said, oh yeah, played cards. So it was always men would play cards. And I said, did I play sheep's head? And she said, yep. And the women would play high five. Now I don't know what high five is. But then there was always lunch. And through the lunch, the men would have a beer. Yes? That's high five. That's high five. <laughs> This is high five, everyone. Want to play? We'll play high five. Um, there would be lunch, and Grandpa would um, allocate out wine. There would be wine. Now, of course, Grandma didn't have fine china or glassware, so there was, according to Leah, a shot glass. You got a shot glass full of wine. Now, when we grew up, and we would go to my Grandpa's house, and we grew up with some traditions, and there were card playing, and there was wine, but we had a wine... We had wine, um, nice fancy little wine cups or wine glasses for that. And as kids got um, glasses, which we thought had wine in them, but it was grape juice. We didn't learn that till later, but we had grape juice in our fancy cups and everybody else had wine in their glassware and beer for the men, of course. There was always the good lunches afterwards. We talked about Christmases when it's a big deal for Christmas if you got an apple or an orange. And one of the reasons is because there wasn't fruit around here. And as people grew older, even into the generations of my Grandpa Schultz and my mom, there, it was still a big deal if you got an apple or an orange for Christmas. Leah told me that right before Grandma moved into her house in Alda, she anguished over the fact that she was going to have to do something with her dog. She owned a big dog, and it wasn't fair to take a big dog into a town. And the day before that Grandma had to move to her house, her dog died. So Grandma's dog is buried out here by Grandma's old house. Grandma used to always wear her long black dress. And she used to say, I'll just change my apron and I'll be ready to go. So as always, just change the apron and you could go. Now, at the end of her life, Aaliyah said, Grandma had winds in her hair. And I said, what is winds in her hair? And she said, you know winds. And I went, no, I don't know winds. And she said, they're growths. So Grandma didn't want anybody to see the growths, so she wore a black dust cap with a little bit of lace on it. So Grandma was always a proper lady with her proper clothes. I can change my apron. I can go anywhere. And she did. I'm going to uh, bring up some of the pictures that I have now, so excuse me. These pictures are also some pictures that are over here on the table. The top picture is the one of Anna and John Thompson. And the pictures that are to the sides are their individual pictures. They're just snapshots that I took off of some pictures that Leah owns. The one to the, this side is the adult children of Anna and John. It's Grandma Emma and all of her brothers in their uh, later years, and there are more pictures of that up here. This is a picture of Anna and John and their one daughter, Emma. This last picture on the bottom is a picture of Anna Steer. It was taken the summer before she passed away. She was 92. She passed away in 1925. You can tell. <laughs> that some of this is a little emotional to talk about because there's so much inside of us as a family, not because we are so, um, we're proud of where we come from, but because this family's gone through a lot to get to where we are today. Their children were solid citizens of the community. They were officers in the, the county. They were, some were legislative people. Um, Grandma Emma was the role of the homemaker, but she raised uh, eight children, and those people continue to do great things in the community. 
when we get together when we were younger, out of respect for people when they would have birthdays, it was always proper for us to uh, shake hands. And like with Uncle Bill's birthday, we always had to, as children, go up to Uncle Bill and shake hands. And we would say, in German, congratulations. Now, I remembered that to be Galadiok. Leah said to me, I said that to her, and she looked at me, and she said, Galadiok. So I've learned some of, to replenish some of my German that um, I've known for a long time. I want you to know that the family of Anastir thanks you for your interest in her family, and thank you for coming today. Now, we will be um, available for questions. Leah is here. If you had any questions for Leah, I would ask that you direct them to uh, David. And uh, the rest of the family is available to, um, to answer anything that you might want to know about, to look at some of the things that we have up here. There will be some lunch that will be served. And if at all possible, we, I would like to try and get some together for a picture. But if it's not possible, we'd understand. So thank you so much for coming today. He said, and don't you laugh at me about this. And 
And I said, I'm not, because you got on the boat and you took a little ride out there and you felt connected to Grandma, didn't you? And he said, yeah, I did. And that was the day that I went out there to be, my mom, my aunt, me and my grandson went out to walk around on Ray's property. Anthony and I felt like we walked on the Mormon Trail. Ray was showing us things about there. He was very, very gracious about having us, letting us be out there around that. And I just stood there and let the sun shine on me and I felt connected. So it's all in the pride or the, what you feel in your heart. And we're very, very humbled to be a part of this great legacy, that the lineage that comes from this family. So we try the best that we can, as we said, that's a manosphere, to do what we can in the community. There are still people who are farmers, um, even though they're not getting the kind of prices that the, farm, the settlers got back in those days. One of the things that I put down in the bottom of my pictures, which I set somewhere now, um, there is a thing down there at the arch in Carney. And it says, the cowards never started, the weak died along the way, only the strong survived, and they were known as the pioneers. So I consider that to be a great tribute to one strong woman. And now next year when Hall County has its 150th anniversary, I don't know if there's going to be big plans or not, we're kicking around a Thompson family reunion and probably go out there and stomp all over Ray's place. <laughs> so Ray, get ready. But Ray will be ready. We talked about it already last night. He's going, you know, the old settlers picnic was right out here at the beginning of our road, and we could put a tent right there. We could get some grass growing. So it's already going through the minds of a lot of people. Um, so if the county does something next year, we're going to try to be doing something as a family. Hopefully, what I've given you today is a picture and a story behind one single white woman. Um, so when you read all these things next year and they'll give you all these recaps about Hull County, you can know that that one single white woman has a story. And hopefully um, it was one that you enjoyed here. Thank you. You got your original acreage, and then if you agreed to plant 10 acres of trees, you could get another 100 acres. That was my understanding. That's where some of the farm ground came from, and that might have been what all that tree digging was about. <laughs> and, yeah, you could get more land. Yeah. You could get around, around the tree, so everyone head out there and find yourself yeah, a tree. Yeah, get yourself 10 acres of trees, and you got another 100 acres of ground. And don't forget the whiskey bottle. Yeah, and <laughs> Lee and I spoke one day, and um, she said that you could also buy ground from the railroad and that uh, Grandpa John made sure that his boys had enough land. So some of that land was purchased from the railroad, is my understanding. It's very traditional that the men would get farms for the boys, because the boys had to be the providers. And now, I'll plant more things in my yard, and every year I keep saying I'm not going to plant anything more, and I still do. I don't put pictures on the wall inside the house, but I'll dig in the dirt. So I think there's a little bit of that coming through there that the ownership of the land is an important thing. And I think that's what drew them here. Aside from Grandma and I see Grandma. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but the ownership of the property and the half property and the whole thing in here and to develop it's an important thing. I appreciate your little map of pictures there. That really helps. I'm so and <laughs> Ray Evans is the gardener and he's not the No, I didn't. Fred is the president of our association. <laughs> If you like the videotape, see Larry and he'll arrange the brief and make arrangements with him. Also, if you'd like to learn more about the history of Hall County, we do have a few books for sale. We have the History of the First Settlement by William Stolle for sale. 
We have uh, Dr. Manley's newest book about the trails uh, across the state. And we also have a picture book of uh, the history of Hall County that was put together by the Independent and the Hall County Historical Society. This was a number of years ago. And we have some of those books available in the park. And we have a couple of Stolly houses here. I have some Capitol theaters. I can't remember what else I have. I've got a, just a few of them here. That's all we have left. But they're all available at Wadi's. And uh, I guess. Somebody take your things so we can identify them all. <laughs> <laughs> 